clearly. I paused there in the doorway as the noise washed over me. It was the third time in two years that I had to walk into the cafeteria on my first day in a new high school. The stakes were high, but I was not given a guide. Where I sat would influence who I knew and how I was accepted in a new place, and I only had a brief moment to make a decision. Some groups were easy to see, the athletes in one corner and the drama kids in another. Did I want to try and see if there was a space for me with the cool kids or maybe the nerdy kids? Or do I just try to find the table with the outcasts? It didn't matter which group it came from. But in that moment, I longed for an invitation to one of the groups any of the groups, because lunchtime was so much more than just a time to eat my PB&J, but to find a place where I could belong and my soul could be nourished. In his book, Wishful Thinking, theologian Frederick Buechner writes, we don't live by bread alone, but we also don't live long without it. To eat is to acknowledge our dependence both on food and on each other. Lunchroom politics aside, food is something that brings us together. I have so many memories created around my family's dinner table. We celebrate with food and we console ourselves with food. So many of our gatherings with friends and family center around food. And it's not surprising here that Jesus uses imagery of food. But we know that it's not just the food that nourishes us, but the relationships that come alongside it. When I was in seminary, I suddenly found myself single again. And I think maybe the hardest part in all of that was getting used to all the meals alone. Because whether it was a quick snack or a carefully crafted dinner, it it lacked that seasoning brought by sharing with others. Well, today we heard from Proverbs, wisdom has built her house. She slaughtered her animals, mixed her wine, set her table. And we heard Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. God has built a house for us. And Jesus has issued an invitation. We are all invited to feast with Jesus and to feast on Jesus, the bread of life from heaven. We're invited to abide in God's house, feeding on Jesus, the word made the one who gives his flesh for the life of the world. And in God's house, we are nourished. And just as our physical bodies use physical food to regenerate and repair, slowly replacing our cells and incorporating the nutrients that we consume, I trust that by feeding on the body of Christ that we will become what we consume. That bit by bit, our wants and our desires will be replaced by who Christ is. That we will come to want to what Christ wants. That we'll come to desire what Christ desires. And I trust that bit by bit, as I consume Jesus, the bread and the word, it'll nourish my body and slowly become who I am. As we respond to this invitation to feast in God's house, and I take my place at the table. I look around and I notice who is not here. Because just as the cafeteria had many gatekeepers that decided who was worthy to sit at each table, our world seems to be full of gatekeepers deciding who is worthy to feast on Jesus. Every week, 
Christ sets it free and offers himself here in many places. And we are called to invite others to that table. When we have found a place to belong and when we want others to have the same, when we truly believe, we know that Jesus has offered his life for the sake of the world, and we have experienced the abundant life that comes from believing, we want all people to know God's grace and God's promises for themselves. So I want you to think for a moment. This isn't a rhetorical question. I want you to think. Who do you know that is missing from this do you know that is longing for a place to belong? Now I can hear some of you thinking, that sounds an awful lot like evangelism, Pastor, and we're great friends. We don't do evangelism. Can't tell you how many times I've actually heard that phrase. But I'm here to tell you we do. When, when we go out to a new restaurant or have a great meal, we're so quick to want to tell others about it. And when someone asks, we have no problems giving recommendations for vacation spots or home repairs or a new recipe. But when it comes to talking about our faith in Jesus Christ, the bread who came down from heaven for the light of the world, or when it comes to inviting others to experience our church, we get nervous and come up. In his book, Invitational Christian, Lutheran pastor Dave Daubert writes, one of the reasons why we might not invite people is that we are afraid. He writes, fear comes in many forms. Some people know that less and less people attend church, and these people fear rejection. People are religious and they fear being seen as weird. Some people know that they know less about the faith than they wish they did and they fear seeming stupid. But I'll tell you, Christ answers our fears. When we fear the rejection from others, we know that we've been claimed in our baptisms and that nothing can separate us from the love of God that matter. When we fear being seen as weird, we remember that we are called to be in this world, but not of this world, that maybe we're meant to be weird. God's people were set apart to live in a physically different way so that through them all people would come to know God's blessings. And when we fear that we don't know enough to invite others in to experience this just tell you, you don't have to know everything. In fact, Martin Luther said, we are all mere beggars, telling other beggars where to find bread. That is it. Now, inviting others can be hard, even when God has answered our fears. I mean, we assume someone will decline, so we just don't invite them. Or maybe if someone has said no once, we don't want to be a pest, so we don't ask them again. But when they haven't yet seen the feast or experienced abundant life in Christ, it is hard for them to know what it is they're missing. And so we continue to invite. We continue to be God's presence in their lives, drawing them into God. But when we invite, we have to be ready for the Spirit to move within them and for them to show up. And so when they do, let's be ready to welcome folks in. Let's remove every barrier so that they can experience the nourish and grace, nourishment and grace that we know is found at this table. Perhaps we can follow the example of the child and the story that led to Jesus' teaching here. This child only had five loaves and two fish, and yet they had the to share their lunch, which then fed 5,000. They didn't know how their lunch would help, but they offered what they could. 
we invite others, we, we don't know what will come, but we offer what we can, knowing that God can do great things with us. Because every invitation we issue has the potential to help someone see themselves as a person of worth, as one with whom God would be concerned. Every invitation could help someone new taste and see that the Lord is good and give them eternal life. In Christ, the bread from heaven who gave himself for the life of the world, we know that we have eternal life, abundant life. And so we are freed from sin so that we can freely love others. We're freed from the need to make ourselves worthy so that we no longer have to worry about whether others are worthy. We are freed, fed and nourished so that we can simply tell other beggars how to be free. Amen.